This video was brought to you by Brilliant. On Tuesday, Fitch downgraded Israel's credit rating from A plus to A, warning that the war could continue well into 2025 and that further cuts were possible. And this didn't go down well with Netanyahu, who released a statement insisting that the economy is strong and is functioning well. But Fitch is now the third big credit agency to lower Israel's credit rating since the outbreak of the war. And while Israel isn't at risk of an acute crisis in the near future, the war and its effect on Israeli society have exposed some more long-term problems for the Israeli economy. So in this video, we'll take a look at how the Israeli economy has developed over the decades, why things were looking up before October 7th, and why the picture is a lot murkier today. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. Let's start with a bit of context about Israel's economic history, because, well, it's interesting. There's a popular story that's often told about the Israeli economy that separates its economic history into two periods. Its social democratic period, which runs from 1948 until the mid-80s, and its capitalist period, which begins in the mid-80s. Yep, you heard that right. It's almost hard to imagine now, but Israel was actually pretty left-wing in its inception. The constant threat of war after 1948 and the socialist nature of the kibbutz made the Israelis pretty keen on big government, which allowed David Ben-Gurion's left-wing Labour Party, or its forerunners, to dominate Israeli politics until the late 70s. Anyway, in this narrative, Israel's economic potential was squashed by socialist regulation and planning, and its economic success should be credited to the neoliberal reforms implemented in the 80s by Prime Minister Shimon Peres. Perez cut government spending, raised interest rates, and devalued Israel's currency, the shekel. And Israel's inflation rate quickly came down from its 1984 high of nearly 450%. After a brief dip, Israel's economy started growing at about 5% a year. And ever since, the reforms have been paraded as proof that right-wing economics are better than left-wing economics. However, while it's true that the reforms were broadly successful, this narrative misses out perhaps the most impressive part of Israel's economic story, which comes in the 50s and 60s. After declaring independence in 1948, Israel faced a deep economic crisis. As well as having to recover from the devastating effects of the 1948 Arab-Israeli war, it also had to absorb hundreds of thousands of Jewish refugees from Europe, and almost a million from the Arab world. As a result, unemployment was high, growth was low, and foreign currency inflows were limited. However, from about 1952 until the 1970s, the Israeli economy grew rapidly, with GDP increasing by an average of 10% per annum, and GDP per capita by about 6%. This was partly because of American aid and German reparations, but it was also because the Israeli government used that money to protect and nurture certain domestic industries, including agriculture, textiles, and diamond processing. In 1950, Israel's GDP per capita was about half that of the UK, but by 1972, it was basically equal. Unfortunately though, Israel's economy took a turn for the worse in the 70s, and that was for two reasons. Firstly, and most obviously, war. Israel fought and won a brief war against its Arab neighbours in 1967, but the 1973 Yom Kippur forced Israel onto a war footing, with military spending going from under 10% of GDP to nearly 30%. After the war, Saudi Arabia and other Arab oil exporters declared an embargo, pushing prices up by 300% almost overnight. Prices remained high until really the mid-80s, and this was terrible news for Israel as an oil importer. In this light then, Israel's economic history is therefore probably best divided into three periods. Its social democratic period, which runs from 1948 until 1973, what we might call its war period, which runs from 1973 until the mid-80s, which and its modern period, which runs from the mid-80s until today. Anyway, however you split it, Israel's economic story is one of success. In part, thanks to its booming tech sector, Israel now has one of the highest GDP per capita in the world, and is widely considered to be the most developed country in the region. In fact, before October 7th, Israel's economic prospects looked even better going forwards, thanks to the Abraham Accords. 
For context, the Abraham Accords are a policy originally formulated by the Trump administration that involves normalizing relations between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Normalization might be hard to imagine today, but Israel's Arab neighbors were open to it for two reasons. Firstly, even if Arab publics weren't particularly pro-Israel, Israel's Arab neighbors aren't democracies, and Arab elites were just more keen on the economic benefits of normalizing trade relations. Secondly, while Palestinian statehood has historically been a pan-Arab movement, Hamas's growing links to Iran meant that the Arabs, and again especially Arab elites, increasingly perceived it as more of an Iranian proxy that they were happy to ignore or even undermine. The Abraham Accords were a real success then. Israel normalized agreement with both the UAE and Bahrain in 2020, and the Biden administration continued with the policy, hoping to eventually convince Saudi Arabia to join too. Had they succeeded, the Abraham Accords would have been great for Israel economically. They would have facilitated trade with its ever wealthier neighbors and reduced the threat of conflict, which would have allowed Israel to reduce its military spending and invest more in public services. Unfortunately for Israel though, October 7th and Israel's war in Gaza have scuppered the Abraham Accords and put a massive strain on Israel's economy. Despite drastic cuts to public services, a roughly 100% increase in military spending and a 20% drop in GDP has pushed Israel's annual deficit to over 4% of GDP in 2023 and over 8% in the 12 months until July, which means that it could plausibly come in above 10% this year. Now, this is unlikely to trigger an acute debt crisis, but as the Fitch report noted, if the war continues or escalates, this would mean even more military spending and massively dampen consumer confidence in the domestic economy. The last time that Israel went into battle on this scale in 1973, its debt ratio passed 100%, sparking a financial crisis and then an inflationary spike when the central bank tried to print its way out of trouble. The other long-term risk to Israel's economy is its politics. Israel's unstable politics and the ongoing dispute over Netanyahu's controversial judicial reforms were already undermining investment and putting downward pressure on the shekel before October 7th. But Israel's politics have become increasingly dysfunctional since October 7th. Without a functioning government and politics to stabilize Israeli society and introduce required reforms, Israel's economy will continue to struggle. Perhaps the most difficult reform involves the Haredim, an ultra-Orthodox Jewish minority who aren't really economically active. The Haredim originally made up a tiny fraction of the population, but their super high birth rates mean that they now account for about 14% of Israel's population, and are due to account for something like 25% of the population by 2040. Now, they already cost the treasury millions of shekels, and the fact that the current government have been able to convince the Haredim to join the military doesn't bode well for future reforms that might get them into the labor market. There's a lot of difficult decisions to make here, and making huge decisions is difficult, even for world leaders. The good thing is that brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in maths, data, programming, and AI. Their interactive classes help build your critical thinking skills through problem solving, not memorizing. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you'll also be becoming a better thinker. For instance, their Predicting with Probability course can help you better understand and assess the world around you. You can learn to wrangle massive data sets, compare distributions, and master fundamental concepts like Bayes' theorem. That might sound a little technical, but with their active learning, you learn this by answering questions like which airline is least likely to have a delay due to weather, and how much more unruly airline passengers have gotten since the pandemic. Data skills are absolutely necessary for navigating the modern world, and Brilliant is the best way to get them. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash TLDR, or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription.